Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks ever so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Roy Ballam, and I'm the Managing Director and Head of Education at the British Nutrition Foundation. And I'm delighted that you can join us this evening for How Do I Create a Worksheet webinar. Uh, my colleague Frances is also with us this evening, and she's going to be monitoring the chat box um, just in the, in the background. So if you've got any questions, please feel free to pop them in. Um, we're also um, trying to get back to you with any links that you might have too. And we'll try and make this as enjoyable as it possibly can. I'm sure you've all had quite busy and stressful days. So we'll definitely finish on time this evening. So a little bit of housekeeping, first of all, that we are recording this presentation at the moment and it will be available on our website, foodeffectoflife.org.uk. As I mentioned, please do use the chat box just check that the setting is to panellists and attendees. That will be great. And at the very end, when you leave the presentation this evening, um, you should be um, directed to do a very, very short survey. It will be on your web browser. And if you go through the survey, you can then download your CPD certificate. Um, don't worry if you don't get a link, we'll actually um, get back in contact with you tomorrow via email. So um, everything should be fine because we know the certificates sometimes important for different portfolios and so forth. So let's really think about tonight about how do I create a, work a worksheet? And I suppose really this is more than a worksheet. And we just use this as a kind of a as an idea to try and consider about how do we actually create learning resources for the pupils in our care. And it's something um, that I've always considered and I'm a former secondary food teacher myself. And I remember being on teaching practice, having to create worksheets with pretty much no uh, instruction or support. And it's quite challenging, isn't it? It can be really, really a big thing. Um, and there are so many different factors you need to consider. So in half an hour, I'm, try I'm gonna sort of gallop through this and try and raise a few issues try and look at a few solutions and hopefully we can get through this together but actually improve our practice overall. So the objective tonight is really about looking at creating resources, what needs to be considered, a little bit about looking at good practice, um, considering some aspects of resource type, looking at some of the basics, writing the questions, looking out for the pitfalls. I'm a, pre, I'm a pr uh, prior uh, A-level examiner so I know about that one a little bit. Um, thinking about progression and then also considering about assessment and sometimes we might do that in the classroom with low stakes testing so it might just be your hands up all the way through to formal examinations for example. So where do I start? So as I mentioned you know those of us that have been on teaching practice or perhaps you're on teaching practice now as a trainee then you're given, given a topic to try and teach and you're trying to think of a resource to, to cover and I know I started with, with, well, how do I create a worksheet? What's the format? How many questions? What do I need to do? Um, what's the best way to support this learning? What font do I use? What color should it be in? Do I need images? What type of images? Where do I get the images from? This is probably pre-internet days and it was probably me <clears throat> with some magazines and a print stick. Um, what kind of depth do I need to cover? And also, how do I actually write the questions in the first place? So really what you need to think about is what those considerations might lead to. So we need to always remember what's the rationale for the resource to begin with. So really what's its purpose or what's the learning intent that you want to deliver from that one resource? Are you having to map against any curriculum issues or parts of qualifications? Or perhaps you're extending that, perhaps you're working in SEND school and you're looking beyond the curriculum and to see what other things you might want to do. So it might be about independent living or, or skills for employability, for example. Then we also need to consider about our teaching strategies that we have and what the, those are the most effective. And we're going to touch upon those this evening. Really important to all of this is about the pupil, that individual and their needs and how best we can support them through this learning journey. Of course, we need to then think about the construction of the resource, so the type of resource, how we use it, the language we use, how it's put together, 
I mentioned font and the font size and the colors and so forth. So the practicalities. Perhaps it's also about use of command words, which we'll go through as well. So are we actually giving the right type of instruction to the people for them to be successful and they can then understand what they need to do? Also thinking about sentence length. Um, so, you know, are, are the kids actually having to strain their neck going from sight left to right reading something because the sentence is too long and by the time they got to the end, they can't remember what the beginning was. And sometimes will illustrations, charts and photos be a help? Will there be a hindrance? What are they there for? Are they just wallpaper filling a gap? So all these sorts of things we do need to consider. And really, you know, if you're going to write a worksheet and putting something together, you know, can we as the teacher actually answer the questions? Because that's the acid test, isn't it? Can you actually do it yourself? Also, we need to consider if we've thought about what the learning intent is going to be, clearly we need to think about the learning impact and how we're going to assess that resource or that part of teaching as we go through. Very briefly, um, I just wanted to touch upon these uh, pedagogy approaches, and this is something which is on the gov.uk website, part of some research that was done a few years back, and the reference is there. And there were just a few, a few things which I thought was interesting related to resource and resource production. So one was around pupil voice, so that's getting them to think about how they can play a role in supporting not just the teaching and learning, but the resources in which um, are used. But I thought this one was in really interesting, is about what the teachers do and what the teachers know. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. So when we're developing resources, it's really also about being secure in our own skills and our own knowledge. So that links into training, a bit like this evening, for example. Um, clear, clear thinking about longer term outcomes, that's fine. And that maybe looks at those short term goals as part of that scaffolding approach as we go through. But also on that scaffolding, thinking about that prior learning and experiences and, and do these resources support that prior learning? And if not, why not? Is it not important? And we've got that scaffolding again. So we've got that base, firm foundations and building on top all the time coming through. Other aspects around about that range of techniques. So looking at when we're teaching, are we always using the same approach, the same resources, the same maybe tried and tested, but maybe we need to push forward a little bit. Um, also considering that sort of higher order thinking, and we're going to look a little bit about blooms um, from maybe just acquiring that knowledge to actually applying and then using that to synthesize, analyze and create going forward. Um, and also, as we touched upon already, it's about making sure we have that assessment for learning too. So just those things that we need to think about the way in which we teach that pedagogy that also then does intimately relate, relate to those resource development too. So when we're thinking about our own practice, so being secure in our own practice, I just thought of a few, a few resources that you, you may, be, may not be aware of. So one is around sort of characteristics of good practice and we've got two documents around teaching food in primary and one in teaching in secondary which is really about looking at our own, our own skills and competency. And I've just put the kind of 11 areas here in the secondary document, just as an example. So these are quite useful to have a look at, to make sure that when you're planning to teach, we're aware of the skill level and depth so forth as we go through. So really here, the tip is about being secure in your own knowledge and skills. The other document to make you aware of which is really helpful, and I wish I had this when I first of all started teaching, was really around guidelines and for producers and users of resources about food. And these have recently, about a year or so ago, been developed. They're, they're voluntary, um, which are out there. And really it's about making sure ultimately that our pupils have access to up-to-date and evidence-based resources to support their learning. Um, and they're really aimed at setting those and promoting those high standards, clearly making sure we've got good consistency of information, supporting the curriculum and really sort of promoting that best practice. And they cover 14 areas. The first five around content, which I think is quite helpful and supportive of when we're creating resources. So, for example, here, I've just popped in the healthy eating nutrition ones. 
because what they do is they perform that consistency framework to make sure that we're on the right track. And we do that also around food provenance, preparation, as in cooking, food choice, and then healthy lifestyle. So these will help to make sure that we're covering the right type of area as we go forward. And the other remaining nine really focus on kind of the nuts and bolts of developing resources. So it might be around teaching and learning. It might be around about whether they're original, about the design, the production of them, whether you've had any testing or feedback. Remember, we mentioned pupil voice, um, whether they're reflective of the society, culture and religion, for example. And if there's someone like uh, who I work for, um, British Nutrition Foundation, are their contact details if anybody's got any query or a problem that they can contact us about the resource. But these things clearly relate to the classroom. And when we were developing these, the teachers in the group suggested sort of like a quick checklist. And this is something that we produce so that if someone's creating a resource, um, including teachers at school, it's something you could look at and then just quickly tick it as you go through to make sure you are sort of matching these key guidelines for basically creating great resources as we go through. So top tip, use the guidelines. So what about the teaching and learning aspect? So I mentioned earlier a bit, a bit about Blooms and um, this is something that we always did a lot of and I'm sure some of you do it at school too. And really it's sort of starting, let's say down the bottom about that remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing and so forth. And, and you'll go through this in time with your pupils at different stages and come back to repeat these aspects too. So that scaffolding type of approach. So have they got the recall? Do they understand that? So can they classify and describe or discuss that? Can they apply that information in a, in a meaningful way? So they may have remembered the Eat Well guide uh, food groups, but can they apply that to a person's diet in a meaningful way? Uh, and then you can go right the way up to the create. So really thinking about that nutrition knowledge they have and potentially creating um, sort of recipes and diets with evidence, obviously, to back up their decisions. And just as an example here on our website, we've even got, based on Bloom's, um, different activities. And this is a thinking hot question, which uh, Francis, my colleague, remind me of. And I thought it was quite a good one just to put here because it does show that although... Um, there's lots to, lots to consider. It's a great way to stretch and challenge people um, based on the same activity. So this idea here is that they might take one of these ideas at random after they've made a quick scone based pizza. But equally, um, depending on your class and your situation, you could give some of these to different pupils, therefore looking at differentiation in your class um, and being supportive of them. And it's interesting, isn't it, how the, the blooms um, sort of different levels here can really easily form to one, just one simple making activity, but really extend that learning as we go forward from this. The other issue to think about is the level of content. And a while ago, back in 2019, we did a similar webinar looking at sort of schemes of work or schemes of learning, depending where you are in the UK, and really thinking about building blocks and looking at progression of knowledge. And this is uh, an example here of what um, we might be faced for with in the curriculum in England. Um, and really what we were looking at is how you might build up over time about a firm foundation of food and drinks, five a day, the eat well guide, energy and nutrients, and then looking at uh, dietary needs. And you could apply that Bloom's effect here too. So you could think about recall and knowledge. So name and list, and you could work through to apply, which I mentioned on the previous screen. And then you could work upwards to about how you could evaluate different diets and whether they're suitable and the types of foods that might be eaten. But equally, they apply at any time because you could evaluate the Eat Well Guide, you could apply dietary needs and health messages at the same time. So it's good to have a firm foundation, but also look at blooms in a different way exactly like we did with that sort of pizza question, where you're using that effect, but using it to perhaps challenge pupils, but also differentiate and support potentially the less able to. I wanted to talk a bit about um, why we develop resources. And then if we're writing this scheme of work or learning and, or lesson plans, 
um, often we'll start with what those learning objectives are and that can be a challenge particularly if you've got aims and objectives and trying to work out the differences of the two these are some of the ones that i've come across with in the past um, and i would probably say to avoid those but if you've got a list like this about the objective is the pupils to list to give examples to state to describe to compare to outline evaluate and so forth what you're really doing is helping the learner to be able to demonstrate to others what they can do and it also helps us to think about the resources that we might want to create especially around activities tasks and questions and this is just on the learning objectives but this equally can then apply to those resources that we need to develop in order to help the pupils meet that learning objective that learning intent as we go forward and then we can read that into the teaching styles and approaches so yes we've got lecturing and presenting demonstrating you know investigation and so forth so we just need to consider which of these is the most appropriate for that learning um, objective that we really wanted at the first place and then lastly we've got what type of resource and why so we've got the classic worksheet which we do a lot of and really they're a great great way of trying to capture that learning to provide feedback to give marks to get assessments um, they're easy to do obviously now we have some digital ones too but that's really the reason behind that one and we need to consider how they're put together we have presentations they provide information but it's very linear um, approach as we go through so is that learning sinking in how can you do that some people get the kids to write notes or perhaps there's some um, sort of writing frames which they need to fill in as the teacher's going through the presentation or it's self-study presentation there's flashcards so more active learning so you've got resources that require them to consider and apply and to work together perhaps in small teams there might be displays and posters a very visual approach which provide information but think about whether sometimes are they just wallpaper are they just there in the background to look pretty or are the pupils actively engaged with them and using the information to support their learning and therefore the assessment that you've put in together videos again can be linear although we've started at feed factor life to introduce interactive videos where the video automatically pauses say five minutes in and poses a question or gets them to do a multiple choice question for example just to add that little bit of extra layer of getting that learning going through and whether the pupils listening and responding to the content there's interactive tools like nutritional analysis for example and also just simple things like pre-written recipes and menus and this might link into active learning about recipe modification it might be about looking at menus to put together meals for people perhaps with different dietary needs or using case studies so lots of different resources lots of different outcomes and reasons and of course we have investigations and experiments to look inquiry um, so this might be moving up blooms more to near the top and then we've got tasting activities um, as we go through too and then stories perhaps um, helping to set a context maybe a springboard into an area and they could be real life or they could be completely made up uh, i remember using the story of the gingerbread man to set the scene in a food story in a primary school for example so there are lots of different ways in which we can really get and motivate pupils going forward and of course we've got books and magazines and internet searches just to really add that context but also they can be used for analysis um, and used back to try and apply prior learning as we go forward so when we think about all this information we need to consider about that form that format so we've got the kids doing note taking we've got writing frames charts and tables as a good resource going forward we've got the whole issue of questions which we're going to touch upon whether they're multiple choice or open questions and then considering the marking of those for example so particularly with an open question how much detail does a pupil need to give how many marks will they get for an answer um, and how long do you want that answer and what sort of the key components of that open question that you'll give credit to so the pupil knows and has that expectation explained to them um, in advance there are comprehension exercises based on text and case studies so therefore it's about 
reading and understanding and comprehending um, the text and being able to use those questions to analyze that text. Uh, I think a really great one is about using data charts and graphs and really getting them to read them and then use them and apply them to answer questions or look for trends, um, perhaps going forward. Of, of course, they could generate their own too. Um, I've already mentioned about menus, but equally looking at food packaging, looking at the difference of nutrients provided by several different parts of packaging would be good, perhaps which is lower or higher in, in sort of sh in sugars, for example, and then sort of applying that um, onto, a, onto a bigger scale or into sort of a menu or a diet, for example. And we've got simple things around counting, sequencing, matching or looking at missing items or words in resources, sorting things into groups or odd ones out. So there are lots of different formats that we can go through. And of course, there's text and illustrations and photographs. So there's a lot here, lots of variety to keep our teaching fresh, hopefully keep the kids motivated going forward too. I, I said I'd talk about questions and this is one that I know the BNF Education Group usually groans at me about, but I have a sort of a few pet hates. So the question here, can you name the groups of the Eat Well Guide? My answer to that is either yes or no, because I haven't asked them to state the name, to list the names. I've just said, can you? So just think about the question. Another one I've seen in places, think about the different foods that provide fiber. Okay, I've thought about it, but I don't need to write anything or say anything because you've only told me to think about it. Name as many vegetables as you can. Do you want me to write it down, tell you about it? Um, do you want me to list them, group them? Do I have to write five vegetables or a hundred? And if I write a hundred, do I get more marks than five? So really it's start, you know, thinking about what is the answer you want and then write the question. Um, and then can you then answer the question? Um, and this is what I used to do when I was writing um, examination papers is really start with your answer and then go back and write the question. Um, and that's more of an acid test to make sure you're, you're going to be on track. I mentioned a little bit about, you know, sort of command words and about the learning objectives. And these are just some I've put on. And there's a link here to <coughs> AQA um, where they give some suggestions around the GCSE food prep. And I think these are a really good way to start thinking about how we write worksheets or uh, activities and tasks for pupils, you know, really making sure that we use that command word to give pupils direction. They really do support that learning objective. And also they'll help to guide assessment too. So list five things, calculate X, describe, blah, blah, blah. It really does help to, you know, pull, pull everybody in the right direction. It's clearer for the pupil and it's clearer for us as well as uh, practitioners. When we look at this then with Blooms, we've got the knowledge, so we've got list, name, state, we've got that understanding or that comprehension, so explain, compare, contrast, outline, summarise, application, interpret, apply, so forth, Anal an analysis, analyse, effects, compare, synthesis, design, create, recommend and evaluate, decide, assess and test. So everything sort of comes together um, in making sure we're using the correct command words, but also looking at that sort of uh, that sort of theoretical framework too. And of course, this links in directly to our assessment. So we've talked a little bit about sort of marking schemes for worksheets and questions, but also we can think of a variety of different approaches. So I mentioned low stakes, where perhaps you just put your hands up, kids answer a question, or you use Kahoot um, sort of uh, questions uh, online uh, and on the whiteboard or online quizzes. So it's not in their formal assessment, but they're getting feedback as they go along. But there are also different ways of doing it. So we've talked quickly about marks for questions. Um, do they know what they get? Practical work, how work is, um, success is rewarded, what criteria is used. And just on the right here is an example of something we developed many years ago for the National Licence to Cook programme, which really was about lesson observation and giving credit and ticks for different criteria that when pupils were cooking and perhaps they could do that as a self-assessment or perhaps it could be a peer-reviewed assessment as they go through too. Um, there's a lot around self-assessment we could be doing, the role of homework, 
And then perhaps there's also something to do around, you know, the end or the start of different modules or terms with practical and written work to look at progression as we go through. And of course, there's formal examination. And lastly, really to bring up about the area around differentiation and, and often we won't need lots of different worksheets. So for example, the pizza example I gave with the blooms, that was one sheet that actually was already differentiated, whether for the pupil or for the teacher conducting that. So really about looking at your schemes of work or your schemes of learning and lesson plans and see what you've already stated in those. You can see on the screen here, here's some examples of what we've written in some of our exemplar schemes of work um, for year seven. And you can see here, we've, we've written in lots of different differenti differentiated approaches here. And this can be extended as we go through. And remember, we can imp automatically put in this, some of the Bloom's um, work um, around from remembering, listing and so forth, actually to applying and creating. So therefore, um, really sort of helping the differentiation aspect to our lessons. So this was all called, what about a worksheet? So what would be my tips about a worksheet? Well, I would definitely say, remember the date, name and possibly group. Um, I always used to forget that in school. Um, think about, can they actually read it? Is it clear? Is it legible? And so forth. At BNF, we even have a font size for different age groups um, that we use um, right the way through to be consistent. Um, you may or may not have noticed we even have different colorways for different age phases too. Um, what is it actually for and is it needed? Um, I mean, sometimes a worksheet, is it just to keep them busy? Um, do we need it? Could you just write the question on the board or at this stage with remote learning in a different way? Or is it that you're actually getting it for assessment purposes uh, and it's easier to, to, to have that sort of come back completed? Um, and can the worksheet be answered based on previous learning? And if not, what other resources might they need? Um, so for example, do they need any other equipment or do they need a calculator? Um, and if we're trying to stretch them and they haven't been taught it before, do they know to where to go to, to get that information to support them going forward? We also need to consider those command words and question types. And it might not just be a written question, it might be around sorting information, looking at matches um, or looking at missing words, for example, just to add some variety to the worksheets. Um, and perhaps using those real life examples from menus or labels or data charts as we go through. Have we made sure the assessment is clear? So you get one mark here or five marks for an open question, for example. And really, have we, have we actually proofread it to make sure it's eligible then there's no um, legible rather and there's no spelling mistakes for example and can you actually answer it that's the again back to that acid test as we go through to the end so really this evening i know it's got a complete whiz through but really my take-home tips for this around resources is really first of all being secure in your own knowledge and skills that's absolutely vital um, always remember that learning in that learning intent and then that impact. Focusing on that, the pupils that you teach, knowing them and their needs is absolutely critical to all of this. And then that focus on that language as we go through, whether it's grammar, spelling, and actually sometimes just getting to the point. Um, so we might have pre-rambling lots of text in a worksheet, for example, and then ask a question. And actually, do you need that paragraph of information to begin with, or just the question? Um, so sometimes it just might look off-putting. Off it's about being creative and thinking about all the different sort of ways in which we can tackle resource production um, and those sort of strategies which I've highlighted this evening, um, as well as just being creative in design and so forth. Again, if it's legible. Um, about using maybe existing materials and resources as a starter, and you can always adapt. And I think that's a great way, and there's lots of great places where you can... Uh, look at resources. So there's things on Food of Active Life. Uh, those secondary teachers might have also been on the Food Teacher Centre. There's uh, also sort of resource platforms such as TES Resources and Twinkle, for example. There's, there's a lot out there in order to give us inspiration as we go forward. And sometimes it's the simple stuff that trips us up. So again, just making sure you've got the name, date and group on those things as we go forward. 
So I hope that's been um, of interest this evening. Um, it's been, as I say, a real quick whiz through um, about resource production, and I hope you found uh, that of interest. And of course, there's lots of reading and links that I've put into this presentation this evening. Um, there's more training coming up. Uh, in fact, last weekend we had a conference uh, which is for teachers in England and coming up shortly we've got one in Northern Ireland and then one in March um, in WOW. So I hope um, if you're in those regions you'll join us for those. Um, we've got uh, another webinar coming up uh, aimed at primary schools looking at, th uh, looking at a thematic approach to teaching food and nutrition. Um, that's in March and we also have on our website all the previous training that's happened um, as videos. And we also have Anytime Training 2, which is an online modular course uh, around sort of primary and secondary good practice teaching too. So please do have a look at the different training options that are available, as well as signing up for our personal professional development um, newsletter, which I hope would be of interest to you too. So really, that's um, well, thank you from me tonight. Um, I'll just check in with Frances to see if she's still there and see if we've got any questions or anything as we go through. But I, but I do hope that you found that very quick whiz through about resource production interesting. Of course, I could be running a three day workshop on this, but I've tried to pull out some top line issues tonight, which hopefully you'll find of interest. And other than that, I'm gonna stay on the chat box um, for a few minutes, minutes more if there's any questions, but just to say thanks for joining me and clearly and to everybody, stay safe. Thanks ever so much. Take care. Bye.